and some. For Christmas now is begun. Make we merry more and less. For well, now is the time of Christmas. Hello, it's Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide here, and here I am at. Eva Castle in Kent, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn. And I'm here on a very chilly winter's evening and here by special invitation because we've come back to Hever to see the castle dressed for Christmas. In a moment, we're going to go inside and meet with Owen Emerson, house manager here at Hever, and we're going to hear all about some very special Christmas Tudor traditions also hear a little bit about how the Boleyns spent their Christmases at Hever when the likes of Mary, Anne and George lived here as children. So let's get in out of the cold. Come with me. Now we mouth all and some for Christmas now is begun. Make we merry more and last. For now is the time of Christmas. If he say he cannot do, then for my love ask him no more. But, but to the stocks and let him go. For now is the time of Christmas. Hello, Owen. Thank you so much for having us back here at Hever. Welcome. It's lovely to welcome you back. And I remember you invited us in the summer to come back at Christmas, and I've been very excited because I've never been to Hever at Christmas before. But as we can see, it's fully dressed for Christmas now, and it looks beautiful. I know one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about, and I'm sure people will be very interested to hear a little bit about Tudor Christmases and how the Tudors spent their Christmas and we're going to be exploring some of that in our discussion today but maybe you could start by just giving us an overview of, of, of some of sort of the key dates of Christmas during the 16th century. Sure well Christmas um, really starts during the Advent period uh, which is four weeks of relative austerity, fasting and soberity um, and that is sort of broken, like almost like a safety valve going off, as, as Alison Sim states, um, quite beautifully. And everything sort of lets rip and uh, much merriment and feasting is had over the 12 days. So that's from the 25th through to the 6th uh, of January. Uh, and although it's very much a, a seen as a Christian tradition, it does have much deeper roots yeah. uh, into pagan traditions, Viking traditions and also Roman traditions. And so the key dates would be what for our Tudor forefathers? Uh, so a key date would be Christmas Eve mm. uh, and that's when um, the last fasting day happens. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to eat, for example, cheese or eggs or meat on Christmas Eve. And that really heightens that, that period of fasting uh, for the last day. And it's on that day that the house would begin to be dressed. Ah, oh, so absolutely. as you have been doing here at Hever. Indeed, yes, absolutely. And uh, although there are 12 days of Christmas, not all of them are, are given the same significance. Mm. Uh, but there are some of my, f one of my favourite dates is the 28th, um, which starts off rather depressingly with the whipping of children. Oh, gosh. Um, it's uh, the date where the, the massacre by Herod is recognised. It's uh, the innocent, uh, Day of Innocence. Um, uh, and then things get rather more festive uh, and um, a, a boy bishop was usually appointed. Uh, so there's a real subversion of roles going on and at court there would be a, a Lord of Misrule uh, and this is someone who is uh, elevated for the Christmas period uh, into a higher status and they're sort of the Ministry of Fun for Christmas, <laughs> one of my, one of my favourite days. So yes. you've got a real mixture of the religious and also the secular and, the, and the, as you say the letting down of one's hair and really having fun because life was tough then. And any other dates that we should know about in terms of the Tudor calendar? I think uh, one of the most significant um, dates is when um, everyone picks their tools back up again. So that happens on the first Monday after the 6th. Oh. It's known as Plough Monday. Um, now, uh, on Christmas Day, uh, or Christmas Eve rather, the plough was actually ceremoniously wrapped up with ivy, uh, as were spinning wheels, because uh, certain labour, anyway, was not permitted during the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, but on Plough Monday, 
um, the plough, the communal plough, will be taken round the villages and you were supposed to uh, donate to the, the ploughman. Uh, if you didn't, they were quite likely to plough up uh, the front of your house. Um, so that's, again, one of my favourite Tudor dates of Christmas. Yeah. And Christmas ended on that day? That's right, yeah, absolutely. So that, that's your festive period over. I, it was back to work. That's right, yeah. From the Miller's Tale by Geoffrey Chaucer. And all above there was a gay psaltery, on which he played a knight's melody, so sweetly it rung, and Angelus at Virginum he sung. Now, one of the things we wanted to talk about was some Tudor festive traditions. And you brought me up here to the Queen's Chamber with some familiar friends. <laughs> but what are we going to talk about here, Owen? So we're in the Queen's Chamber and we're going to talk mm. about what the women did to decorate Teva. Okay. Um, and uh, more generally what women would have been doing during the festive period. To prepare for Christmas right. and, then, and then to see Christmas through. Exactly. So we talked about uh, Christmas being... Uh, the house being decorated on mm. Christmas Eve. Mm. One of the things that Elizabeth Boleyn with her daughters Anne and Mary uh, may well have created for Heva is one of these. It's a kissing bow. Oh, this looks familiar and the whole mistletoe kissing thing, I'm, I'm, you know, I get a sense of the modern overtones there, but tell us a little bit more about it from a Tudor point of view. Absolutely. Well, it's all here, isn't it? The holly, the ivy, the uh. mistletoe, they're all things we recognise and today we probably recognise it as a wreath. Um, but this is more of a, a sphere, globe-like um, decoration. And it was made by sort of wiring together holly, which has a natural curve to it, mm. into two uh, circles. And then they were bound together in, in a cross uh, to create a globe. So the holly and the ivy have uh, a, a significance for Christians and, and the Tudors. Uh, the holly represents the crown of thorns that uh, Jesus wore, the blood uh, of the berries mm. uh, having particular significance. And the ivy uh, grows on trees, it relies on trees to grow, and therefore it had this sort of symbiotic um, symbolism uh, of the support that Christ gives to his followers. Oh. But tell me about the kissing bit, yes. Owen. What's, what's, as I say, I see the mistletoe there. What, what's the tradition around that? Indeed. Well, the mistletoe, again, has its roots in pagan traditions, but on a kissing bough, it served a purpose uh, because each berry that is on the mistletoe represented a kiss. Uh, so uh, warmly greeting your visitors, your peers, uh, you'd have a kiss under the kissing bough, but you'd also have to pluck off one of those berries. Mm. When the berries had run out, so the kisses, unfortunately. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> but it's that continuity, isn't it, that we can see from this Tudor tradition through to the modern day use of mistletoe. It's still there. It's still there. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Owen, for bringing me here to the fire in the Great Hall. It's the perfect place to be on this chilly winter evening. But we're here to talk about the second tradition associated with Christmas. So what is that? So we've already spoken about what the women will be getting up to on Christmas Eve. And we're living in a patriarchal society in Tudor England, so there's a division uh, between the genders of mm. what will be going on. And Thomas Boleyn uh, probably would have been taking his three sons out into the weald across the drawbridge uh, to fell a, a tree. Uh, one of the many oak trees that grows very successfully around this part of the country. Mm. Uh, and what they're doing is cutting down what will be called the Yule Log. Uh, now, we still have a, a Yule Log. It's much more chocolatey. I was going to as, say, it's the kind of you eat, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely. And the reason it developed into a more chocolatey treat is because great halls like this um, really fell out of favour. And uh, yet yeah, they 
became a, a, a much more chocolatey affair. Uh, but on Christmas Eve, the men would have felled this green log. Uh, the Berlin children would have dragged it across the drawbridge into the Great Hall here, where it would have been dressed by the women of the household. And by dressed, I mean it would have been tied up with ribbons, again, holly and ivy wrapped around. And the purpose of the Yule log was to keep it burning for the whole 12 days of Christmas. So you can imagine this is quite a sizeable log that they're bringing in. It is quite a feat, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. But am I right in saying that there was a tradition about keeping a bit of the Yule log? Absolutely. And this taps into an, an almost phoenix-like sentiment um, that you would keep a charred piece of the old Yule log and then light the new one with it. There's this sort of continuity that goes uh, with this tradition, which I, I find most endearing. So Owen, mean, we've been talking about Tudor Christmas traditions, but I'm really curious to know what Christmas was like for the Berlins, particularly when the children were little. You know, what was Christmas all about for them? It's really about shutting that winter coldness out, passing that midwinter phase, and welcoming in, you know, your nearest and dearest, your social peers, giving them fantastic food, keeping them warm, and just having a fantastic time, a real celebration. So, anything else you can tell us about? Well, there was quite an exceptional Christmas in 1526 when Anne is uh, slightly older mm. and uh, this has only really recently come to light uh, through the research of Dr David Starkey so I'd love to tell you a bit more about Please it. Please do, I'd love to hear. Should we go in there, uh, chat? The bull's head in hand bear I be decked with bay and rosemary and I pray you, my masters, be merry, quod est is in convivio. Gabud abri de vero, bread and flores domino. Gabud abri de vero, bread and flores domino. Now, Owen, you promised me a very special story about a Christmas at Teva, and I'm dying to hear more. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr David Starkey very recently um, gave us this information at a public talk here at Teva, and he has been looking through Henry VIII's letters to Anne, which we know the majority of, were, of which were, were sent to Anne here mm. at Teva. Yeah. And uh, in one of the letters, he um, acknowledges that Anne has gifted him a jewel, uh, a jeweled ship, and he quite specifically uses the word etrenne, um, which is a French word which very specifically uh, relates to New Year's gifts. And uh, this we know was a jewel that Anne gifted to Henry on New Year's Day 1527, which is when in the Tudor period gifts were given, not on Christmas Day but on New Year's Day. And that's really significant because it places Anne here at Hever for 1526 during that Christmas period. And what it means is that Anne is actually making that decision to marry Henry here at Hever during that Christmas. So we can imagine that it must have been quite an exciting, perhaps a, a bit scary as well, um, and I, I should imagine quite a lavish Christmas for the Berlins. You can only imagine the excitement that there must have been here at that time. Absolutely, you can very easily imagine Thomas giving uh, Anne counsel, uh, perhaps even her brother George doing so, and uh, it must have been, you know, quite a quite something to be making this monumental decision. I mean, let's face it, not many decisions go on to uh, result in the king breaking away from the church <laughs> in Rome and uh, unfortunately to lead to Anne's downfall as well it, so you can't get you know bigger more decision more momentous that, really. than that no that's true Point. but you mentioned something else which was about New Year's gifts and we Indeed. haven't talked about New Year but that was a really significant time for the Tudors wasn't it it really was and it's um, it, at this point particularly at court uh, when the gifts are given. Now, we don't have any information about this happening in 
you know, more humble households. It might well have. Uh, but this is certainly where the gentry uh, gave their gifts to the king and where also the king would have uh, given his courtiers um, gifts as well. Mm. Henry is an incredibly lavish uh, king. We know that for his first Christmas, uh, he spends the equivalent of 13.5 million in today's money on the Christmas <laughs> festivities at court. Uh, so this is really sumptuous and lavish affair. Uh, but New Year's gift giving is really a very opportune uh, moment to ingratiate yourself to the king. And there are rituals um, uh, reserved uh, for that period. It's also a period where the household would give gifts to the king um, as well. Um, but the king didn't always have to accept your New Year's gift. And uh, I want to tell you a bit more about gift giving in general and this uh, rather awkward etiquette of rejecting gifts uh, downstairs. OK, so I think that's where we need to go next. Shall we? OK, let's go. Some. For Christmas now is begun Make we merry more and less For now is the time of Christmas Let, Let no man, man come into this hall Groom, page, nor yet marshal But that some sporty bring with all For now is the time of Christmas Now we mirth all and some For Christmas now is begun Make we merry more and less For now is the time of Christmas If that he say he cannot sing Some other sport Then let him bring That it may please at this festing For now is the time of Christmas Owen, oh, you brought me down to the inner hall here And I think we're going to be talking about this clock So what has this clock got to do with New Year's gift? Right, so it's not actually a New Year's gift. This is a replica of the clock that Henry gifted to Anne for the occasion of their marriage in 1533. But I think it gives a really good indication of uh, the calibre and, and cost of um, the gifts that were both given to Henry and by him. Uh, so these are incredibly detailed and expensive items that will be exchanged at New Year. Uh, now, I alluded to earlier the fact that Henry didn't always accept gifts. Mm. And the year before this gift was given to Anne, Anne herself presented the king with some boar spe uh, spears, mm. uh, which he gladly received, but rather excruciatingly. Uh, Catherine, of course, uh, who still considered herself very much to be his queen, mm. uh, gifted the king a gold cup, which he rejected very publicly. It must have been quite a point of humiliation for Catherine. Yeah. Uh, now, Henry didn't always reject uh, gifts from his former queens. Uh, he re retained a very good uh, relationship, for example, with the other Anne of Hever, Anne of Cleves. Uh, even after the annulment of their marriage, he continued to receive her at court, for example, uh, at Christmas, and, uh, and uh, accepted her gifts. And of course she was known as the King's sister, wasn't she? Absolutely. She was so much in favour, I guess, from having stepped aside so graciously for yeah, His Majesty. Absolutely. And it's probably apt that we're talking about that, Anne, in this room, mm. uh, because in the Tudor period this actually would have been the Great Kitchens. And we know from one of uh, the more shady characters in Anne's household, uh, Thomas Carden, uh, that Anne actually had a passion for cooking. It's in his papers that we find this lovely little detail That's out. extraordinary, isn't it, to think of a Tudor queen just kind of putting on a penny and going and down doing some cooking in the, maybe in the kitchens, yeah, where else? I, I mean, most likely here, <laughs> if, if she's cooking in other people's households, I'm, I'm sure she'd be cooking here at Hever. Yeah. Now, cooking was traditionally a very much a male-dominated uh, area. Mm. There were exceptions, however, for example, sugar work. Um, very much like uh, the, the matriarch of the household would look after the tea in the 18th century, uh, in the early modern period, uh, it's the sugar that they're looking after. So I've made a recreation of one of the highlights of the Tudor banquet course, uh, a march pane. Would you like to have a look I at it? I would love to have a Fantastic. look at it. This is a march pane. Well, what is it? <laughs> so, we would recognise it today as marzipan. Oh, I see. Um, but in the early modern period, it was uh, not a decoration, but a meal in and of itself. 
so this will be the highlight of the banquet, which was the most prestigious course of a feast. And it is essentially made of almonds, ground almonds, powdered sugar, beat up in a mortar and pestle, and rose water, brought together into a paste and then baked. Uh, so you'd roll out a disc, mm -hmm. bake that, and then create your decorations. It was very commonplace um, to uh, tap into one's heraldry, uh, initials and, and such like. And this is served up and eaten as a meal um, uh, finisher, as it were. Oh, so it's almost like a dessert, yeah, as absolutely. we would think of it today. That's it. And I see here you've just done a wonderful little monogram of H.A., Henry and Anne, and of course, Anne Boleyn's crest. Absolutely. It looks absolutely beautiful, I have to say. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all that remains for me to say is thank you so much, Owen, for showing us around the castle, dressed for Christmas, talking to us about a Tudor Christmas at Hever. It's been absolutely delightful. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, it's one of my favourite times of the year, so pleasure's all mine. And, and how can people enjoy this for themselves? So I'd encourage people to go on the website, have a look at the dates that we're open. We're open right up until Christmas, and then we have a, a couple of days off and then a winter walks period as well. Uh, so there's a huge amount to come and see here. We have an old-fashioned fairground. We have a beautiful trail through the garden, uh, which again is themed Alice in a Winter Wonderland. Amazing um, things to see in the grounds as well as the castle. So I'd really encourage people to come and have a really memorable family Christmas here. Yes, indeed. And, and I guess with that, all that remains to say is, well, a Merry Christmas to you, Owen. Merry Christmas. And also a Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas. And some for Christian mass now is begun. May Queen Mary more and less. For now is the time of Christian mass. Let, Let no man, man come into this hall. Groom, haze nor yet marshal, but that some sporty bring with all. For now is the time of Christian mass. Thank you. 